Okay, now this is the vocabulary video of the sanctuary class, the first one. Uh, the first lesson is on introduction and orientation of the class. Uh, before we start, let's have a short prayer. Dear our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we want to study the sanctuary subject together with the Holy Spirit which we understand is one of the most important um, doctrines that you have given to our church. Give us special uh, wisdom and understanding as we concentrate and focus on this subject this semester. Thank you so much and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we will uh, do the sanctuary class, the first vocabulary session about introduction and orientation. As you have seen in Revelation class, this is uh, me and my husband. And if, if any of you do not, uh, does not take our Revelation class, this is me and my husband. The first word we want to look at is William Johnson or Johnson they say. William G. Bill Johnson is a Seventh-day Adventist author and was an editor of the Adventist Review, the church's flagship weekly magazine from 1982 to 2006. Born in Australia, he earned his PhD in Biblical Studies from Vanderbilt University. So this is in the U.S. And also, Dr. Gerhard Hazel studied uh, from Vanderbilt University, too. His dissertation was entitled Defilement and Purgation in the Book of Hebrews. He taught New Testament classes in the Adventist Seminary from 1975 to 1980, he also contributed to the section on Hebrews for the Darkum series. About Darkum series, we will mention shortly. Second one is Julius Wellhausen. Interestingly, he was born in 1844, was a German biblical scholar and orientalist. In the course of his career, he moved from Old Testament research through Islamic studies to New Testament scholarship. He is credited as one of the originators of the documentary hypothesis. It is one of the models used by biblical scholars to explain the origins and composition of the Torah or Pentateuch with JEDP theory. I believe you have heard about the JEDP theory by Julius Wellhausen, and he used this theory to explain the origin of the documents of the Old Testament texts. Darkum, the seven-volume Daniel and Revelation Committee series is one of the most important publications in SDA history. Daniel and Revelation Committee series, commissioned by the Daniel and Revelation Study Committee in response to the Glacier View theology crisis of the early 1980s. The series explains how the two 2300 days years prophecy of Daniel 8 culminates in the 1844 pre-Advent judgment. Do you remember this one, Glacier View uh, Conference? It is to handle the Desmond Ford crisis, right? In the Darkum series uh, was written to defend the Adventist sanctuary message from uh, Desmond Ford's influence and to remove the confusion among the people in at that time. Edited by Frank B. Holbrook, 
This series is the crown jewel of SDA scholarship in biblical prophecy and the heavenly sanctuary doctrine. The series handles the sanctuary message from Daniel and Revelation and Book of Hebrews. Jeff Fisher is a professor of theology and director of spiritual formation at the Foundry. It's a university name. He also taught at Cooper College, Trinity Christian College, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and Evangelical Presbyterian Theological Seminary. He earned his PhD from Trinity International University and also studied at Calvin Theological Seminary. So he is a Calvinist Presbyterian scholar or Reformed tradition. His work, a Christoscopic reading of scripture, Johannes Oikolampadius on Hebrews, was published by Van der Hoek and Ruprecht in 2016. So he is a scholar of Johannes Oikolampadius, the early reformer uh, before Calvin uh, in Calvinist tradition. Next one is Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger was an American biblical scholar, Bible translator, and textual critic who was a long-time professor at Princeton Theological Seminary and Bible editor who served on the board of the American Bible Society and United Bible Societies. He was a scholar of Greek, New Testament, and New Testament textual criticism and wrote prolifically on these subjects. So he was one of the uh, editors of the Greek Bible uh, producing, as you see here. Athanasius. Athanasius I of Alexandria in late 3rd and 4th century, primarily in the Coptic Orthodox Church, was a Greek church father, the 20th bishop of Alexandria. Athanasius was a Christian theologian, a church father, the chief defender of Trinitarianism against Arianism, and a noted Coptic, that means Egyptian, Christian leader of the 4th century. In 325, at the age of 27, Athanasius began his leading role against the Arians as a deacon and assistant to Bishop Alexander of Alexandria during the First Council of Nicaea. It was in this year they decided against uh, Arianism, right? Ulrich Zwingli. Huldrich Zwingli or Ulrich Zwingli was the most important reformer in the Swiss Protestant Reformation. He founded the Swiss Reformed Church and was an important figure in the broader Reformed tradition. Like Martin Luther, he accepted the supreme authority of the scriptures, but he applied it more vigorously and comprehensively to all doctrines and practices. That is about Zwingli. Now let's think about the term apocrypha. Apocrypha uh, from Greek word apocryphos, the hidden things, are the biblically related books received by the early church as part of the Greek version of the Old Testament but not included in the Hebrew Bible, being excluded by the non-Hellenistic Jews from their canon. So, Apocrypha is not canonical. Their position in Christian usage has been ambiguous. Apocrypha, per se, are outside the Hebrew Bible canon, not considered divinely inspired, but regarded as worthy of study by the faithful. So, Apocrypha books are not considered as inspired word of God. Oh, sorry. 
uh, and it's called the deuterocanonical writings. Uh, some of you will still remember. And uh, this word is here because Athanasius considered the book of Hebrews as a kind of apocrypha rather than inspired word of God, not to uh, put their focus on the detail of the Hebrews very much. The word ritual. Ritual is the established form for a ceremony, an act or series of acts regularly repeated in a set precise manner. A ritual is a sequence of activities involving gestures, words, actions, or objects performed according to a set sequence. They include not only the worship rites and sacraments of organized religions and cults, but also rites of passage, atonement, and purification rites, oaths of allegiance, dedication ceremonies, coronations, and presidential inaugurations even, marriages, funerals, and more. Ritual, in Korean word, we say 의식, right? Uh, you repeat the same pattern of uh, rites that is called ritual in religious practices. Absolute evaluation. Absolute evaluation is determined as a ratio of behaviors for which success can be considered sufficient in a particular scope. In this case, the cre criterion is a predetermined absolute value or an absolute threshold value that is independent of the group and is the same for everyone. It is compared to relative evaluation. Uh, since our class doesn't have many uh, students, we will use the absolute evaluation. What it means is if all of you uh, get points, scores higher than 90%, all of you can even get A or A pluses. Contrary to absolute, the relative evaluation uh, has to have certain portion of uh, lower grades. Uh, so, it is in your benefit that we have absolute evaluation system for this class, I believe. Outer court of the tabernacle is the in the wilderness and later the temple was the place of sacrifice. <coughs> it is where sin was dealt with. As the first part of the tabernacle encountered by someone who wanted to approach God, the outer court represents the first stage of any Christian life binding Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Here is the picture of the <coughs> sanctuary in the wilderness. Over there we see Mount Sinai. And here is the sanctuary building, and this part is called outer court, where there is the altar and water basin. Okay. <clears throat> Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is any of a wide variety of breads which are prepared without using raising agents such as yeast. Unleavened breads are generally flat breads. However, not all flat breads are unleavened. Unleavened breads have symbolic importance in Judaism and Christianity, where yeast symbolized sin. Jews consume unleavened breads such as matzo during Passover, as commanded in Exodus chapter 12. <coughs> Since yeast symbolized sin, unleavened bread symbolized the purity uh, of the believer coming to the Passover uh, ceremony. 
Next one is altar of incense. The altar of incense is the second altar in the sanctuary system. <coughs> of course, the first altar was the altar of burnt offering, yeah. called also the golden altar. And the inner altar stood inside in the holy place before the veil. That means the veil between first apartment and the most holy place. That is by the ark of the covenant. The altar was constructed of shittim wood, acacia wood, and covered in pure gold. Incense was burned daily on this altar at the time of the morning and evening sacrifices representing the prayer of the believers. <coughs> Vindication means Justification against denial or censure. The fact of pro proving that what someone said or did was did was right or true after other people thought it was wrong. Christians are vindicated by the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. So we may say vindication is kind of the similar meaning of justification happening on the outer court of the sanctuary system by the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Cherubs, a cherub, the plural form is cherubim, is one of the unearthly beings who directly attend to God. The cherubim are the most frequently occurring heavenly creature in the Hebrew Bible. <coughs> As the Hebrew word appears 91 times. In Exodus 25, God tells Moses to make multiple images of cherubim at specific points around the Ark of the Covenant. Many appearances of the words cherub and cherubim in the Bible refer to the golden cherubim images on the mercy seat of the ark. Let me go back to, oh uh, yeah, this one doesn't show the cherubim, but <clears throat> in the most holy place, there is the ark of the covenant, and the cherubim are covering, um, the angels are covering uh, the, the ark. The mercy seat, right? 16th word, wash basin. The wash basin was a laver of bronze used by priests in the tabernacle in the wilderness as a place where they cleansed their hands and feet. Unlike the other elements in the tabernacle, no measurements were given for the laver's size. It is located between the altar the first veil of the holy place and symbolizes the baptism in Christian life. <clears throat> Honorification. Honorification recognizes the elevated social status of a participant in a clause with respect to the subject and or the hearer. Honorific marking may be manifest as your stigma of sins has been eradicated and the record of your sins removed by the most holy place ministry of Jesus as a heavenly high priest during the investigative judgment. Um, the investigative judgment or the most holy place ministry of Jesus means to remove the record of your sins, right? As the record of your sins are eradicated, your sins are not remembered even among the heavenly beings. So your status is honored and God wants to honor you through the investigative judgment process by removing your sins, of course, your repented sins. All right. Lampstand. The Hebrew word for lampstand is menorah, 
and it derives from a verb that means to flame. The name menorah simply underscores the utilitarian purpose of the lampstand. It is to give light to the priests who work in the holy place of the tabernacle. In Exodus 25, God told Moses that the menorah as well as the entire sanctuary was to be made after the pattern or blueprint provided from above as shown to him. The lampstand was to be made of pure gold, providing light to the sanctuary. Signifying the Holy Spirit and the mission and good deeds of the believers. Right? <clears throat> now we come to Decalogue. The Ten Commandments, also known as the Decalogue, are a set of biblical principles relating to ethics and worship that play a fundamental role in Judaism and Christianity. The text of the Ten Commandments appears twice in the Hebrew Bible at Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. According to the book of Exodus in the Torah, the Ten Commandments were revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai and inscribed by the finger of God on two tablets of stone kept in the Ark of the Covenant. The last term is perfection. The quality or state of being perfect, such as freedom from fault or defect, maturity, the quality or state, state of being saintly, an exemplification of supreme excellence, and an unsurpassable degree of accuracy and excellence. These are the word meanings. In the Bible, many patriarchs are described as perfect, and Jesus commanded, be ye perfect, and in many uh, Pauline epistles, also uh, he uh, admonishes the believers to be perfect. It should not be considered as a goal which will be achieved by human efforts in the far future, but it is to be pursued in everyday life of Christians. So perfection means daily surrender of yourself to the will of God and giving up of your known sins daily. So it is the daily activity and uh, state rather than a far future goal. And I believe also Ellen White uh, described perfection in that manner. Okay, we have looked at the 20 uh, terms and words in relation with the sanctuary class, the first class, and we will talk about the details of the class during the online, first online class. And I will also announce uh, to the e-class and also Kakao Talk. And welcome all of you and let's have a very wonderful, uh, fruitful class together. Thank you so much. <clears throat>